Merry Christmas, church. Thank you for being here this morning as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This one song has been going through my head the last week or so. And it's um, a song that was sung by Lauren Daigle. And I want to share just a few of the lyrics with you. Love incarnate, love divine. Star and angels gave the sign. Bow to babe on bended knee, the savior of humanity. Unto us a child is born. He shall reign forevermore. Noel, Noel, come and see what God has done. Noel, Noel, the story of amazing love, the light of the world given for us. Son of God and son of man, there before the world began, born to suffer, born to save, born to raise us from the grave. Christ, the everlasting Lord, he shall reign forevermore. Noel, Noel, come and see what God has done. The story of amazing love, the light of the world given for us. Noel. Awesome and glorious Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to celebrate to celebrate your goodness, your life, your love, your light pouring into a sin-dark world to redeem your special creation. God bless this gathering as we celebrate and praise you. Amen. I invite you now to stand as we sing together, Joy to the World. share the word from 1st John. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. He sent his only and one son into the world that we might live through him. Dear friends, since God so loves us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Let us pray. Father God, we can only love because you first loved us. Jesus, we invite you to dwell in our hearts that the Holy Spirit may increase more and more as we extend the love of Christ to all humanity, not by our own strength, but through the power of Christ who lives in us. Amen. Let's sing number 242, Love Came Down at Christmas.
may be seated. The word today comes from Psalm 77, verses 11 through 14. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Your ways, O God, are holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. Thank you, Karen. Today we are going to finish our study from the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Did anybody watch any of it last night? <laughs> we watched most of it until we came back to church. I'm Stephen Skelton. Welcome to the Gospel of It's a Wonderful Life. Thanks for joining us. Our fourth lesson is entitled Ordinary Miracles, and our biblical principle is miracles. Our key scripture is Psalm chapter 77 and verse 14. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. As our lesson begins, I will be guiding you through video clips which illustrate the biblical principle of miracles. One of the best endings ever. As I said before, George is no longer looking at his life through the eyes of the world. He's looking at his life through the eyes of heaven. And from that perspective, George can see that the most important things in his life never included his finances. Rather, they were his faith, his family, and his friends. Well, it's now time to stop the video and begin your discussion on the biblical principle of miracles. May God bless you. Would you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, on his return to the rural world, George ran through town uh, toward home, overflowing with joy. So filled with goodwill was George, he even greeted his worst enemy. Merry Christmas, Mr. Potter. To which Potter replied, True to form. Happy New Year to you in jail. Go on home. They're waiting for you. And while Potter's report may have been expected, what George did was truly unusual. Showing love to our enemies will not come easily. Likely it will not uh, f be fed by our feelings, but rather it will require a very conscious effort on our part. To love our enemies means to do what God says is best and what God determines is best for them. To want God's best for others, even our enemies, is to love them. Whether you're praying for them or speaking kindly to them or even helping them with a problem. Luke 6, 27 and 28 said, But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Why was George kind to Mr. Potter? What did you get out of that? Why was he kind to him? What do you, what do you, holy experience. he had a holy experience, yes. He had an encounter with God. And uh, we, we see, we've seen the Grinch, the story of the Grinch several times. His heart grew, didn't it? It opened up to God's perspective on life. What had Potter done to deserve any kindness? Nothing. Nothing? Okay, we can agree on that, huh? All of us have people in our lives that have done harm to us. Or maybe, maybe I'm just imagining that, but I think all of us have. Who despise you for one reason or another, or hate you because of no good reason, or maybe it's even because you love God and put God first in your life. But we are able to love one another because God first loved us. Can you think 
and you don't have to tell me unless you want to, can you think of a time that you have shown God's love to someone who hurt you, who harmed you, who caused you grief? Maybe a nod or two. Okay. Is that the advice you wanted at that point? <laughs> no. <laughs> but. but I right. doesn't mean you have to be the closest of friends, but to love someone means that you, right, and, and, and if you think about how Jesus instructed us to pray for our enemies, um, it changes our heart, just like you said. You can't pray for someone and for their well-being without it affecting you, can you? Anyone else? Oh, yeah, Joel, go undoubtedly had an impact on your relationship, for sure. Yeah. As soon as George got home, the waiting sheriff started to speak in the somber tone to him. George, I got a little paper for you. George interrupted him with a cheerful voice, and I'll bet it's a warrant for my arrest, isn't it? Isn't it wonderful? I'm going to jail. Seeing the examiner, the bank examiner, and the reporters, and the sheriff suddenly reminds us of the trouble that George was actually in. Bankruptcy, scandal, and jail. So how can George be so happy? In dealing with trouble, we do not have to look at our lives through the eyes of the world or looking at our circumstances, which can make problems seem overwhelming. Instead, we can look through the eyes of heaven, which which reduces the threat of a temporary troubles when compared to eternity and relationship with our Lord and Savior. Hebrews 13, 6 says, So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? I'll add that if God is for us, who can be against us? How could George be so content in his troubles? What made him so content in his troubles and and okay that even though he knew that what awaited him was could likely be jail time. Yep. He let, he let God be in charge. God was in charge. Yep. Can't do anything about it. 
God's in charge, and God is good. Instead of gloom, despair, and agony on me, he focused on God's perspective. Faith, family, and friends as, as good gifts, and the fact that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. What trouble have you been in recently? And how can embracing God's perspective change that dynamic? Everybody has challenges in life. Did you? Huh. Not in control. <laughs> That is the great surrender. Yep, that's the word that comes to mind. Um, acknowledging that God is above all those things. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have been comforted with or have received from God. At the heights of his career, director Frank Capra was gripped by fear of failure for weeks. Then a friend introduced Capra to a man who reminded Capra his talents were God-given. Immediately, Capra felt his fear leaving. He never saw the man again, but he never forgot what he had said to him. After a joyful reunion, Mary began to describe what George was about to witness. George, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. And a minute later, Uncle Billy, who was last seen slumped in despair because of the lost money, he entered in jubilantly. Mary did it. George, Mary did it. She told a few people you were in trouble, and they scattered all over town collecting money. Just as Uncle Billy received comfort, he now gave comfort to George. When believers seek comfort, God readily provides, but not for our benefit alone. We receive consolation so that we can be ready to receive, or to console others from 2 Corinthians. So why did Mary call what happened a miracle? And how was that, the comfort they received miraculous? Why did she call it a miracle? And how did uh, what they received seem miraculous? Absolutely. Well, what is a miracle after all? I mean, it's, it's a supernatural occurrence without a natural explanation. It went contrary, goes contrary to what nature determines. People responded to the need, and believers, as believers, we respond to God's prodding in our lives to meet, meet needs of others, and that includes providing comfort and Sometimes uh, the challenges that we go through are um, maybe for the benefit of others. We can't see anything good coming out of it. But when we've experienced something that we can then help someone else with, it means that we're lined up with God and useful to his kingdom. In the original script, after Uncle Billy brought the large basket of money and an even larger crowd of friends, he dropped to his knees in the Bailey living room and led the crowd in, crowd in saying the Lord's Prayer. I don't know why they cut that out, but... Neat. Arriving just as the parade of family and friends in the Bailey living room began to celebrate with uh, wine, Harry Bailey lifted his glass. A toast to my big brother, George, the richest man in town. And Harry wasn't talking about the money in the basket on the table. 
While the world thinks of riches in terms of financial gain, the believer sees riches as in regard to favor of God and the blessings of the gospel and the love of those who are dearest to us. Jesus is a great model for this viewpoint. Although Christ put off his Godhead, he still did not seek worldly riches. Yet through his sacrifice for our salvation, he made us rich beyond measure. 2 Corinthians 8, 8 verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. In the basket of money, George found a gift even more valuable. Inside that copy of Tom Sawyer that Clarence had left him as a gift, um, George found this inscription. Dear George, remember, no man is a failure who has friends. Thanks for the wings, love Clarence. It is a reminder to us that our lives are not meant for solitude, but that we do live life in community. And God organizes, structures us, brings us into community. How had George invested in the lives of others, and how was he rewarded for having friends? Seems pretty obvious, but uh, um, it just is another reminder to us that we might not even see or know the consequence of our lives and God working through us, but definitely as we trust in God to be the ordainer of all things, that we trust that he is working his good and perfect will in our lives and in the lives that he touches with us or engages with us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. do our thing. And what we put forth every day, yep. thinking that it's not anything huge, yeah. but it is. It is. It is. Yeah, and we're reminded on Sunday morning, you know, I pr we pray and God use this for whatever to your glory, um, but that should be our, our daily and uh, daily throughout the day prayer, shouldn't it? Revelation 3, 20 and 22 says, I stand at the door and knock. Let's read that. Can somebody look that up for us? Revelation 3. I'll let someone else. Revelation 3, verses 20 through 22. Somebody have that? Dennis, would you read that? Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and to me. To whom the Lord comes, I will give the bread to sit with me on my, on my throne, with the power of the people sat down with my father on his throne. He will never hear, never hear what the Spirit says. Yeah, right? <laughs> right, absolutely. Right. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Ours, our life. Yeah, Laura. Yeah, please. Yeah. Oh. 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 
this party you're celebrating. And he invites us. Yep. Yes, absolutely. That's quite the beautiful image, isn't it? That, that abundant life is ours, that, our, that re reconciliation with God and that invitation to be in his holy presence through faith in Jesus. Our sins are forgiven. We're made righteous, holy, just in the eyes of our God through faith in him. That is the greatest miracle, isn't it? A changed heart and reception of what Christ has done for us. I tell you, uh, Jesus said in Luke 15, 7, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. Each life is infinitely valuable to God. And the rejoicing that we see in the movie, depicted in the movie, is just a foreshadowing of that celebration that is ours. That has already happened when we've given our hearts to Christ and that will be consummated on that last day. And it's in that hope that we live and move and have our being. Any other comments from this series that we did? That, yeah, sounds, you know, somebody should make a song about that. Oh, they have? <laughs> there is a song for everything, right? Absolutely. But you're right. That joy can be ours when we finally get to heaven and see Jesus. Much more joyful than the joy of mm -hmm. Yeah. Everything in this world that is, that is good and beautiful and, and lovely like that is just a glimmer of, of what it'll be. Glorious God, we thank you for, for allowing us this time to, to dwell upon your word, to seek, to, to understand, to see things, and, and through the artistry of others in our world who, who get a glimpse of, of your kingdom and, and your goodness, and, and we're able to then be encouraged by those things. And by being encouraged by one another as you um, impact our lives, as you quicken us, to your side, to your table. Thank you, Jesus, for that gracious, benevolent invitation. Help us to fully embrace and to desire you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Bless your people today in this celebration day and all days. Amen. Glorious God, you are the sovereign over all of creation, and you are mindful of your, uh, your people, us frail, um, finicky, rebellious, and yet you desire our love and devotion. God, we surrender. We surrender our all to you because of your great love for us. We are able to love one another because of that. Thank you for giving of yourself, pouring yourself out. Jesus, for be, being willing to take on that uh, frail condition, becoming like us in all those ways and yet without sin. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We, we praise you, the one true God. 
and we lift up one another as you have called us to pray for one another and we entrust one another to you and to your good and perfect will. We pray for restoration. We pray for healing. We pray for wisdom. We pray for guidance. We pray for strength. We pray for perseverance. God, thank you for hearing our prayers. We pray to you, Father, that prayer, that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and continues to teach us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand and sing with me number 228, He is Born. And with that, I invite you to receive God's blessing. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you, he is faithful, and he will do it. Go now in that love of God, that joy of God, that peace of God, to love God and serve his world. Amen. <laughs>